Hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar event uh, titled Lost Opportunity Education for Out of School Youth in Emergency and Protracted Crisis. My name is David Kunyu. I'm a data and measurement coordinator at INI, and I'll be your moderator for this session uh, today. And I wish to start by thanking you all for making time to join this quick conversation. And most of many thanks to our presenters who for accepting to share their research findings and for affording us the opportunity to learn from their work and to more importantly engage on what solutions to lost opportunities will look like. As you will hear from the speakers uh, lined up for this session, they highlight the present inequalities in humanitarian education response that potentially seek to deprioritize the youth. So we all again know that education emergency programming is heavily invested in foundational and basic education with less focus on equipping the youth with the needed skills that can enable them to thrive and take control of their futures. And to help us understand this better, we have a very able team of experts who conducted the lost opportunity study. And it's now my pleasure to introduce them all to you. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. And a team from the slide before. Thank you. So a team from NOCAP will kick us off with a, an introduction to the last opportunity report that is at the center of this webinar. And that's Maria uh, Sedevold and uh, Frida Bahus. They both supported the research that led to the Lost Opportunity Report. Maria is, has been with NOCAP since 2020, where she is responsible for developing education and youth projects and partnerships. She has worked with NRC in the Global Education Team in the larger Central and West Africa region. She holds a Master's in Comparative and International Education from the University of Oslo with a special focus on the role of the youth, the role the youth can play as peace builders. On the other hand, Frida joined NOCAP in 2017 and was responsible for establishing NOCAP's first pilot on the provision of youth expertise to operationalize the IASC guidelines on working with and for young people in humanitarian and protracted crisis. She holds a master's in international human rights law from the University of Oslo as well. And to help us understand the findings and recommendations of this study, we have Mark uh, Somers, uh, who served as the team leader and lead author for the Lost Opportunity uh, Study. Mark is an uh, award-winning author and an internationally recognized youth and EIE expert. He uses trust-based methods to reveal new insights about inequity and exclusion and detail how to cultivate effective policy and program response. Mark has served as a senior advisor at the US Department of State and Department of Defense. He's a former associate research professor at the Fletcher School he was also a member of the UN advisory group of experts for the progress study on youth, peace, and security. Mark has been a fellow at the Wilson Center, the US Institute of Peace, and the Bellagio Center as well. He is the author of 10 books and the recipient of five book awards. Mark has received his PhD in anthropology from Boston University, and he currently works as a consultant. And to also help us break down the findings and recommendations is May Nessara. May served as a research associate for the Lost Opportunity Study. She is an experienced youth specialist who has represented donors, NGOs, and research institutes in development and humanitarian settings for over eight years. May's areas of specialization are youth-focused programs, strategic program design, out of school youth, and positive youth development. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Auckland School of Education and Social Work, 
And he, she holds a master's in human rights from the London School of Economics and Political Science. We also have a group of youth advisory group members who are very much involved in this study as well. And we are going to hear uh, their perspectives uh, as far as this conversation is concerned. Uh, flanked by Bayan Luis, who is a project coordinator at Multi Aid Programs NGO in the Bekaa Valley, where she leads the higher education department. She is a member of the Youth Advisory Group for the Lost Opportunity Report. Dr. Bayan holds a bachelor's degree in medicine from Albert University in Syria and a master of public health from the American University of Beirut. We also have uh, Balan Gomna, who is a member of the Youth Advisory Group for the Lost Opportunity Study as well. He presently works as a knowledge management officer with local youth corner in Cameroon, where he provides technical leadership on field programming, research, and knowledge design and dissemination. Bala holds a master's degree in international relations from the International Relations Institute of Cameroon. And lastly, we got Oleksiy Drus, who is a Ukrainian refugee living in Bucharest, Romania. He is a member of the Youth Advisory Group for the Lost Opportunity Project as well. Oleksiy presently works as a volunteer at the National Youth Foundation in Bucharest, where he supports non-formal education activities and advocacy-related work. He's also a Ukrainian youth advocate for human rights and education. Oleksiy is a theater director and events manager by education. I will now hand it over to Maria to get us started off. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much, David, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to uh, INEE for organizing this webinar on our Lost Opportunity Report. Um, for those of you who don't know NORCAP that well, we are a provider of expertise to uh, humanitarian development and uh, peace building sectors. Uh, our mission is to improve aid uh, to better protect and empower people affected by crisis and climate change. And given our, man, uh, our strategic objective of empowering people, uh, we believe that it would be important to, to uh, support this study on out-of-school youth in crisis settings. So uh, we believe also that it's important to increase the, uh, strengthen the evidence base on uh, uh, education programming for young people. Um, we were first introduced to this idea actually of conducting research by INE. Uh, Mark Summers had developed a concept note uh, with some uh, with a small group of uh, experts, and um, and we decided to support it. NORCAP has some experience in providing um, expertise on youth, and we have implemented a pilot on uh, to strength to support the uh, operationalization of uh, IAC guidelines on working with and for young people, uh, together with UNICEF in uh, Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. So based on this experience, we have learned that uh, um, uh, it's um, that uh, having youth included in their programming, listening to their voices, and adapting programs based on their needs and interests is uh, is crucial and can contribute to more relevant and uh, programs that are of good quality. Um, however, like uh, our colleagues in the Norwegian Refugee Council and others, we are experiencing barriers in uh, prioritizing education for education programs for youth. We receive a few requests for expertise on youth, and we have not yet succeeded in developing more projects uh, with partners. However, we believe that or we hope that this report will uh, that presents some important findings uh, can uh, contribute to make a change. The, these findings are echoed by our colleagues and partners uh, working in different countries affected by crisis. It recommends, uh, among other things, that the education emergency sector find ways to reaching vulnerable groups of youth uh, and also avoid the current supply orientation of certified education programs for youth. And to achieve this, we need to strengthen capacity and knowledge. And we also need to involve young people who knows best what they need and want and who are innovative and creative 
uh, and help can help us find ways to reach more vulnerable youth. So thank you, and I will leave it to my Mark and my and the rest of the team to present more details from the report. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, I'll welcome Mark to take over. Mark, please. okay. Thank. Okay. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> thanks for setting us, getting us started, David and Maria. I want to say before I start that INEE, the leaders of INEE have been a huge uh, supporter of of this study um, from the outset, from the beginning of dis discussing it as a concept note, and then introducing it to the wonderful Maria Seliwold and uh, her colleague Frida Pereus, um, who have been instrumental in, in making sure that this uh, lost opportunity has taken place. I'm going to start our, uh, our um, presentation and hand over to May at points where we talk specifically about um, programming because that is her, that's her that been her focus for this study, and she's really in charge of that. So let me get us started, and then I'll, I'll bring in May when we get to programs. So maybe the next slide, please. And I'm gonna switch off my video. There we go. Okay, um, we have the next slide. Ah, thank you. No, go back. There we go, great. Okay, so what happened? Go back to slide two, please. There we go. One more. Okay, perfect. Don't leave it alone. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm going to start talking because I don't know what's going on with the slides. Um, the a, a quarter of a billion of, of um, of the world's children and youth are out of school. So it's about 258 million. It's probably more now with the refugees uh, and the and the, uh, uh, the situation in uh, Sudan, Gaza, and South Sudan, the, the, the numbers are even higher. Um, about half of them, uh, probably a bit more now, are in uh, crisis-affected countries. And then what what What's important here is it's it's not uniform. Not all um, children and youth are equally out of um, out of school. Um, there's more primary education available, and as a kid, as a child gets into puberty and adolescence, their prospects for education narrow or end because there just isn't access for them anymore. So the next slide. So the the, uh, the main thing I want to mention here is that UNHCR has called the majority of their um, uh, uh, use of uh, 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 the majority of their people of concern, even though they're invisible. So that's the irony that we start with when talking about young people and their education. Um, so to respond to this, to do something, I, I formed an informal core group, which uh, included Rachel McKinney and Dean Brooks and um, Martha Hewison, NEE, Alessio Baldaccini of um, UNHCR, and uh, also Maria and Frida of NORCAP, um, to develop a concept note uh, to write a study about out-of-school out youth. And that's when, uh, uh, once we had it ready, we, we gave it to Maria and Frida at NORCAP, and they decided to support it, thank God. So um, next slide. The, the focus of this, and this is very important, the focus of this study is certified education. That's important because um, if it isn't certified education, it can be shunted out of the education sector and be considered, say, workforce, programming or non-formal education or something like that. Um, and so to, to make sure that our focus remained inside of the education 
education sector to focus only on certified education for young people. So that's vocational training, secondary schools, accelerated education, and so on. We dropped down the, the age for youth down to 12 to include adolescents um, to represent an inclusion of adolescents because that's about the age when school starts to evaporate in a, a humanitarian settings and protracted crisis settings. It's around when young people turn around 12 quite often. And so we wanted to represent that in our, in our study. And certainly the people we interviewed considered a youth starting as a 12 year old. So the challenge was that there isn't ha hasn't been much written about this um, on this subject, and surprisingly little. So we did um, document review, but the interviews with 36 experts is really the focal point of, or the, the real core of our data is new and based on experts um, and that are active in this field. Can we go to the next slide? So the who's act so the, the key here is we we really spoke to a lot of EIE practitioners, people who work on this uh, all the time at the headquarter level and also uh, in regions, in different regions in the world. We spoke to a lot of donor officials um, and um, youth and IE, EIE experts. So people that work in the EIE field, but have a specialty on youth. And then the EIE experts would be academics who look at education and emergencies. And then finally, we interviewed some youth who uh, have expertise, experience in humanitarian environments, former refugees and so forth, um, or current refugees um, that have expertise, not only with EIE, but with out of school youth populations. Okay, next one. Uh, another dimension of our study was these two sets of advisors. So we had youth advi a youth advisory group, three of which will be speaking uh, after May and myself today. Uh, these were youth leaders, as well as we had experts on youth and education and emergencies issues. Um, we also had the core group, which I mentioned, which were education and emergencies experts from INEE and UNHCR, and then eventually um, our colleagues from NORCAP. Okay, next slide. So what did we find? Um, I think that this, this is a basic finding um, uh, is that no surprise, uh, most of what EIE does is primary education. It's the main thing people do it's what they focus on. It's the, the primary overwhelming uh, number one activity that's being done uh, in the field. Um, at the same time, there is, it isn't clear who youth are. There's no shared definition on youth uh, or what they seek. Um, so that's, that's kind of our starting frame for the EIE field and the issue of youth and particularly out of school youth. Okay. So the issue of out of uh, overlooked youth is a, is a sort of a, a seminal issue for this. Can we go to the next slide? Um, is a seminal issue for this, um, this study. There is a very, the, the, the response is so inadequate. We all know this for the massive out of school youth cohorts. As soon as you leave a primary school in a refugee camp or wherever, there are all these teenagers and young people in their thirties, twenties, uh, I mean, with nothing to do and they're just there. And that's pretty much part of the landscape of these humanitarian settings. Just huge numbers of young people um, with no, no, that aren't in school and really aren't sort of connected to a constructive future for themselves. We found uh, in this that EI professionals know very little about these people that are everywhere around them um, because they're not in their schools. And this is particularly the case for out of school youth. So they know most of what they know are the children in their programs, in their schools. They know a little bit about out of school children, 
and they know next to nothing about out of school use in there that are immediately around them. That's where we that's where we are. Okay, the next slide, please. This brings us to the issue of gender. Now, gender, girls' education, gender um, is basically means girls in the EIE field. Um, girls' education focuses on pre-adolescent girls, we found. And once a, a, a girl hits puberty, um, and the female use issues are overlooked as basic as sanitary napkins. Um, daycare for unmarried mothers and young wives, as we know, most youth at some point become parents and during their, their period of being a youth. Um, and uh, so th this, these are sort of basic reasons why youth, uh, female youth can't be in school. Another thing is, is there's virtually nothing um, or no attention being paid in particular to boys and male youth education. Uh, it's just absent. Um, I, we didn't find uh, anyone who'd heard of when we doing the interviews of the 2022 study "Leave No Child Behind" by UNESCO on the the um, disengagement of boys and male youth from education globally, and particularly in crisis affected contexts. Next slide, please. The issue of class and access was quite a major sort of theme in the study. Um, as you know, education emergencies is mainly stationary. It's school-centered. It's based in rural areas and refugee settlements, uh, IDP settlements, um, villages, while most youth are mobile and often uh, many of them go straight to cities. Um, so who gets into these programs? Generally speaking, it's youth who are comparatively well off or advantaged, um, who, who live in reasonably stable situations, who don't have to work, who don't have to care for children, um, they can go to school. And those are the ones who have access to education. It's usually a tiny fraction of the entire uh, youth population that's affected um, by humanitarian crisis. And at this point, I want to uh, in, in May to join us and uh, continue the presentation. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, uh, David, for the introduction and everyone for making the time um, for this. So a little bit about sort of the program implications um, that we found during this research. And before I dive into that, I just want to take a step back and share how we got to these findings. So what we did for this research is we started with a mapping through desk review of whatever available publications there are, but also the key informant interviews. We made sure in every key informant interview we did to ask about what programs exist. And the and what you'll be able to see in the report itself in Annex three is a list of 15 programs that are certified for and are for out of school and everything that the next two, three slides will share um, is really based on that mapping. And if I tell you one thing is we really did look far and wide um, for certified out of school youth programs. And the reality is we really didn't find much. And as we look at the program implications of our finding, maybe one key insight is that the vast majority of certified education programs for out of school youth are generic and supply oriented. So this leaves us with an environment where only youth with certain privileges, and Mark spoke a little bit about these privileges, be it social, economic, or geographic, can access education opportunity. And one reflection I really want to highlight from a youth expert we interviewed highlights this issue. So I quote, and you can see it on the slide, if there is a secondary school, then only youth with privileged status can access it. And I highlight this quote because it really illustrates the unequal fields um, we're grappling with. And it underscores sort of this urgent need to shift the way we work and the way we conceive and implement um, education and emergencies for out-of-school youth. 
And if we go to the next slide, we it looks at targeting. So when we look at targeting, it becomes clear that our current strategies, or if you allow me to say the current lack of our strategies, are failing some of our most vulnerable out of school youth populations. So some of these groups are young wives and mothers, youth with disabilities, those belonging to excluded ethnic and religious groups, former members of our groups and individuals dealing with substances and or alcohol abuse. And these are really just some of the subgroups that programs rarely if ever specifically target for inclusion and you can really see this reflection of targeting this reflection of um, the lack of considering of youth youth subgroups looking at all out of sub, out, all, at all out of school youth group as one um, one group where a one size fits all um, is, is 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 applied in the annex where we look at programs and this really not only highlights the gap in our understanding and outreach, but it also really signifies a missed opportunity to truly make education accessible to all, regardless of the circumstances and the vulnerabilities. And I want to move to slide three for program recommendations. Um, well, actually, Mark, do you want to do policy recommendations first? Sure. I'll do that and then pass over to you. So ahead, there are 18. OK, thanks. Um, there are 18 recommendations, 11 policy recommendations and seven program recommendations. And uh, so this is just a, a, a quick overview of, of much of what's there. Um, the first is the starting point is that I think it's clear um, to in our research that the status quo is inadequate. There's no way the current approach to uh, post-primary education can ever work uh, in these humanitarian settings. Uh, the, 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 you can't get there from here in, with the current setup. Um, and there are details about that. In, we go into great deal about the current setup and how it can't work, how it's not working and it can't possibly succeed. Uh, in our study, so the 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 generally the the step is the the important is is to take uh, a steps towards um, an adaptable strategic response to the out of school use challenge, um, and to uh, target key youth subgroups, um, which are examples of which uh, may have provided um, just before this. And then um, I think there needs to be a recognition that we don't have the expertise in this field sufficiently. And so, um, uh, so we need to dramatically upgrade expertise about out of school youth for this field in order to move our field ahead and become, and really demonstrate inclusion to young people, which is a peace building principle because we're not doing that very effectively right now, not intentionally, but that's that's what's going on. And that's what this um, uh, report is designed to help us uh, address. With that, I'd like to hand over to May to talk about our uh, the um, uh, some of the program recommendations. Thanks, Mark, yes, that's my slide. Um, thanks again. So a little bit on program recommendations and um, just like Mark has shared, this is really the actual reports includes a longer list of program recommendations um, that um, have been developed with the youth advisory group, which you'll shortly hear from. And what you see on the slide is really just um, three of that long list of recommendations um, that I thought would be interesting to highlight. And I really want to emphasize that these program recommendations are designed not just as solutions, but also as a call to action. So first and foremost, the recommendation I'd like to start with is that we must place a substantially greater emphasis and support for certified education that reaches out of school youth. The reality is we don't have enough and what we have, as I've shared, um, lacks targeting and is very much generic and supply oriented. The second one, and this is one I'm personally very passionate about, is in designing youth centered approaches that consider what the target groups 
truly need in terms of content, location, time frame, and beyond. Um, we know very little about what sort of certified education out of school youth um, want and desire. And lastly, we must apply a gender lens to all programs. So this means acknowledging and addressing unique, the unique needs and challenges of female and male youth, as, as long as those who belong to LGBTQ plus uh, communities, and ensuring that our efforts are as inclusive and effective as possible. So these program recommendations and the longer list in the actual report really serve as a roadmap towards a more equitable, responsive, youth inclusive approach to education and emergency that really recognizes this diverse need of out of school youth and commits or tries to commit to meeting them wherever they are. Um, this is actually my, la my last slide, and we're going to move now to um, maybe a slightly more exciting bit, which is hearing from some of the youth advisory group members who supported on this report. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Bayan, who I know will then hand it over to Balo and Balo to Alexi. So Bayan, please go ahead. Bayan, you're currently on mute. Um, not sure if you can unmute yourself. Bayan is in Lebanon and she has communicated with me um, that she's facing some challenges. Okay, yes, we can see you now and you're on, you're not muted anymore. Okay. I think you can hear me well. Bayan, go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead, Bayan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, May. Hello. Bayan, I am mean, gather here Bayan, today. I'm honorable to address. Bayan, you maybe you can mute both. your video. A just doctor to be... and the humanitarian worker involved. And the ongoing refugee crisis in Lebanon. My name is Bayan Lewis. Interrupt me when you cannot hear me. So my name is Bayan Lewis, and I have have had the privilege of being a member of the US Advisory Group that focus on education in emergencies and the plight of out of school youth. Today, I wish to shed light on a pressing issue that demands our urgent attention, which is the education agency and protracted crisis situation. To do that, I will structure my speech around the three key points that cover the current challenges and potential ways for progress. Firstly, let us delve into the current context of education in emergencies for refugees in Lebanon. The Syrian refugee crisis that's now spanning over 13 years has created a protracted humanitarian emergency of huge proportion. Despite the great efforts of various stakeholders, the focus remains mainly on providing non-formal primary education. The absence of secondary education services leaves a critical gap. Countless graduates from primary schools find Sounds like we lost the end. Hello, Bayan. Bayan, looks like, sounds like we lost you. Bayan, are you still there? Uh, 
Okay, uh, David, I think we, I, I think we will, I uh, as we, we, we can get in touch, uh, May, will you kindly just get in touch with Bayan? In the meantime, I think Balo can take over. Please go ahead, Balo. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Balo Gomna. I am a member of the Youth Advisory Group, and I'm so happy to be here today to talk about a topic that is, uh, I find so much interest in it. Uh, so, uh, the issue of education for out of school youth in emergency and protracted crisis setting is one that affects us all. And it is not just a problem for schools, but for the society as a whole. And I'm here today to talk about my experience working on this issue with Luka Youth Corner Cameroon through the Salam Initiative. So since 2014, more than 1 million youth have been out of school because of violence caused by Boko Haram extremist group in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in Chad and in Niger. And because of their attacks, more than 2000 schools have been closed down. And this has been a huge blow for education in the region. And it has kept many youth out of their classroom for more than a year now, putting them at the risk of dropping out of school the statistics are even more uh, more alarming with the high uh with you know with with maybe new forms of conflict like the anglophone crisis uh in the southern part of cameroon and the unrest in central africa the consequences from all these contexts are very severe uh, despite this reality i think there is a positive way forward our research reveals this with the help of the recommendations we provided and we can bring our young people back to school and we can do it together as a community uh, first it is important to acknowledge the reason why young people are out of school some may say it's due to fear others may point to a lack of access to education and some may argue that education is not relevant to them why these are all valid reasons. I believe the root cause is a lack of sense of belonging. Young people feel disconnected from their schools, their teachers and their peers. They don't feel seen, heard or valued. Uh, we can change this narrative and we can create a sense of belonging for our young people and we can do it through a community-led approach. So I'm here today to talk about a community-led approach for this. We need to come together, pull our resources, and support our young people in a more holistic way. And here are ways we can do this. One is a community-led support. We need to empower community leaders to actively support education of their young people. We need to provide leaders with the necessary resources and training to create a community-led initiative that can help young people feel connected and engaged. And this can include mentorship programs. It can include community service projects, extracurricular activities that are tailored to the specific needs of out-of-school youth. And to this, we can equally create a community safe space. We need to support communities in creating safe spaces for young people to learn, to grow, to connect with their peers, while providing them with psychosocial support and safe spaces to heal and recover. It is also a means of creating alternative learning spaces, such as uh, community centers, churches, where young people can learn and feel safe. A third way ahead is uh, through a community parental involvement. We need to engage parents in the education of young people. We need to provide parents with the resources, the support and training to help them support children or to help them support the education for out of school youth. This can include parent-teacher association, parenting workshops, home-based learning programs that can help parents become more involved in the education for their children and other young people. But we can't do this all by ourselves. We need the support of donors. We need the support of organizations on the ground. We need the support of the government to make this happen. We need funding. We need resources. We need expertise to create safe spaces that provide the necessary resources and support to community-led initiative. So, so 
I want to use this opportunity to urge you, the, the participants, the practitioners working on these issues, to join us in this effort. Let's work together to bring young people back to school and create a brighter future for them. Let's invest in the education of young people and not just because it is the right thing to do, but because it is the smart thing to do. And this perspective shared here today tie with the need to take steps towards a strategic response and investing in providing substantially more educational opportunity to emergency affected youth with a community focused approach. This approach uh, supports the major recommendation of our research report, focusing on recognizing the inadequate status school and committing to the reform for out of school youth in crisis affected uh, areas. Uh, let's come together, let's create a community approach to bring young people back to school. Let's make a difference in the life of these young people and build a better future for them. And I want to end by appreciating Mark Summers and Maya for unveiling these issues with the results and the findings presented in our research study, The Lost Opportunity. And uh, equally, thank you so much. I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And uh, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to send them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bala. Uh, that was yeah, lovely. Thank you, David. And, uh, we'll get back to you with some questions, hopefully. I will now welcome Alexi. Alexi, take the stage, please. Now, do you hear me clearly? Yes, you are clear. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Alexei Drus, Ukrainian refugee living in Romania, volunteering in the human rights field and advocacy. Uh, I'll not uh, say a lot about me because uh, uh, thank you, David. He said everything we need. And I'm going to start and open my speech with a statement that education for adolescents and young people is a key factor for development of any society. We constantly say that education is important, that it is necessary, uh, it's a priority. But every year when we meet at various events, we discuss the plan for the following year. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, it turns out that the only plan that we are not discussing, but are implementing, is the next year to discuss a plan for another year. Uh, but the thing uh, which I'm going to talk today uh, is uh, the point we don't discuss almost at all or really at all. I attended many meetings and conferences on education in different countries and never once did anyone talk about boys. Over here are girls, women, children, but mostly female. Even so... We discuss but do practically nothing to achieve the important priority goals regarding the education of girls and young women. At the same time, why we don't even talk about boys and guys? I've been to events at various levels and not a single person from many countries uses the word boy. So how can guys help provide for their family and help raise children without having an education? What should guys do when due to circumstances they become parents themselves? And how can a guy from a dysfunctional family, uh, for example, from country in crisis or as a refugee without any education, uh, take care of someone else if he still needs to care for himself? The, finally, what I want to say that every person is a personality and an individual and every person has or should have the same rights regardless of race or religion, place in society or gender, one of which also includes boys and male youth. We should be talking about inclusive education for all children and youth, not only for girls and young women. And now it's a high time for the whole world to understand and explore who all youths are. Uh, I'd like to say thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, my and thank you everyone for having me here and for this opportunity to talk to all of you and to each people who will read our report. Thank you. 
Thanks, um, Alexi and Balo. David, uh, I know Bayan is back online and she did message me that she feels she has a better connection. Um, so I'm thinking maybe we can give it another go um, as people are of excited course. to hear what she said. Of course, let's do that. Okay, Bayan, go ahead and try. And if you still break, you're still breaking, we can definitely share some of your notes. And you're on mute. <laughs> okay, it may be that her connection um, is not. Um... Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I, I start uh, direct on the three key points that I want to cover. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. We can hear you. It's just that there's a delay. So just go ahead um, and share. Okay, noted. So today I wish to shed the light on a pressing issue that demands our urgent attention, which is the education situation for out of school youth in emergency and a protracted crisis situation. And to do that, I'll structure my speech around the three key points that cover the Kesley. Let us delve into Jeez and Lebanon. The Syrian refugee crisis that is now spanning over 13 years has created a protracted humanitarian emergency of a huge proportion. Despite the great efforts of various stakeholders, the focus remains mainly on providing non formal primary education. The absence of secondary education services leaves a critical gap here. Countless graduates from primary schools find themselves aimless, denied the opportunity to pursue further education due to strict uh, requirements, such as certified primary education, residency permit, legal documentation, and high tuition fees. While tertiary education scholarships do exist for some fortunate individuals, they remain out of reach for the majority. Secondly, we must address the imperative to equip out-of-school youth with the fundamentals of education. The current focus of existing programs for vulnerable youth is narrow. They emphasize the basics of core subjects only. This fails to accommodate the learning needs and aspirations of these young individuals. These initiatives, by keeping things the same and not inspiring youth, accidentally raise the dropout rate among those students and preventing many young people from escaping their situations and reaching their fullest entire abilities. The last point, I wish to underscore the urgent need for bridging programs to bridge the gap between primary and secondary education. The absence of such a program creates insurmountable barrier, effectively truncating the educational journey of countless youth and consigning them to a future marred by missed opportunities and realized dreams. It's in incumbent upon the international community and the humanitarian organizations engaged in education in emergencies to prioritize the design and implementation of comprehensive bridging programs to facilitate access to secondary and tertiary education for youth. Furthermore, me as a member of the Youth Advisory Group for the Lost Opportunity Study, it, it's worth noting that one of the report's recommendations focuses on bridging programs. This proposed way forward aligns with my earlier contributions to the group efforts on lost opportunity. In conclusion, the education situation for out-of-school youth in emergency and protracted crisis situations demands our unwavering commitment and concerted action by addressing the deficiencies in the current paradigm, championing inclusive educational initiatives, and advocating for the establishment of bridging programs, we can pave the way for a brighter future for generations to come. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, we appreciate the, those perspectives and reflections. Uh, 
Um, and to our presenters, thank you so much for sharing with us all this knowledge uh, from your findings and experiences from the field. Now I think is the opportunity to respond to any of the questions. Uh, I think we will take a few questions uh, that the participants have asked. Uh, I know Mark, you've already responded to some in the chat, but I think we still have some questions that we require uh, for us to respond to. We have about seven minutes. I think we can take a few questions. Yeah, so um, we will start off with a question to Mark. Um, so there is a Osore Bach from Kakuma refugee camp. Uh, I suppose this is in Kenya. He's asking whether you there is any practical thoughts on how the uptake of these policy recommendations can be implemented. Okay, um, <laughs> thanks very much, and uh, hello to Kakuma. Um, uh, how can they be implemented? I, I, I mean, I think what we've proposed is that the the, the recommendations <clears throat> recall really call for a major rethink of our approach to young people in providing education in these humanitarian and protracted crisis settings. <clears throat> so, what does that mean? It means that we, I think, need to think beyond the status quo um, and uh, think beyond traditional ways of providing vocational and secondary education and accelerated education. Those are the three that you get. Those, uh, those are the three possibilities right now, uh, pretty much in all these places. They're expensive, they're hard to put together, and they don't, they'll never reach many youth. So what are the options? The options, first of all, I mean, everybody's gonna talk about the funding issue, but are we using our limited funding in a way that's strategic and reaches young people and in, indeed um, call, you know, responds to their priorities? What are they looking for? Does a program have flexible hours? Does a program, um, you know, is it in a location that's, that's considered safe for female youth, uh, for ex-combatants, these kinds of people are not gonna wanna go to a school. Do you have daycare? So some of these issues are really basic. Um, and then there's just the issue of reaching out to young people and finding out what it is that they are looking for in a, in a program. Finally, there's lots of opportunities to provide um, or possibilities to providing certified education. Uh, to young people, there's distance education, there's all kinds of digital education approaches, um, there's remote education, um, there's blended education, there's all kinds of approaches. We're not doing a whole lot of that. And, um, and in terms of what's costly and what's effective and what can reach young people in, in cities, I mean, in urban areas, as well as Kakuma camp, uh, refugee camps, um, we need to be we need a lot more research and a lot more creative thinking to make it happen. Thanks very much for that question. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I think we have some other questions. Uh, this one goes to May. Uh, the question is, are there specific types of education opportunities your research identified being provided to out-of-school youth? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, yes, I think that's a great question. And I think um, the, the report really addresses the specific question on what programs are available. And um, maybe very shortly, so just as the EIE sector as a whole, the programs we did find um, usually look at primary level education. And these are programs of two types, really. So they're accelerated education programs, as I mentioned, really focused at primary level. And we were able to find a few um, vocational programs. Um, other than those two, and if you look at the annex of 15 programs, there's really not much diversity. So uh, the vast majority of what we were able to find is really either accelerated or vocational.
Thanks so much. And the, for this, the next questions, I think both of you and anyone else, uh, one of the participants can, of course, jump in and respond to. And uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask, listening to your findings, uh, which is related to another question that is asked is, when, for example, you recommend upgrade of expertise about out of school youth in EIE field, could you please maybe elaborate how you see stakeholders contributing to that specifically? I'm sorry, who, who could you say that again? Who should be uh, co contributing specifically? Stakeholders in the EIE field. To address the, the out-of-school youth challenge? No, the question is about the upgrade of expertise. Uh, about oh, the, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, my God, that is a huge one, isn't it? Well, obviously, um, there has to be a recognition that we have a problem here. And I must say, in doing this research, I think May would join me that um, th this the absence of expertise is so obvious and so overwhelming, but I, I think that needs to be recognized. I think there's a lot of cynicism about um, how expensive it is to, um, to, to provide education for youth as if it's their fault. Um, there's there's um, an, an absence of any recognition whatsoever of male youth as a particular population, even though they're leaving school in droves all over the world. Um, uh, they're the issue of, of bridging programs that Bayan mentioned is very important. Um, Alexi mentioned the issue of um, boys not being recognized or reached out to, bringing in communities uh, to help uh, uh, reach uh, young people, which Balo mentioned is also uh, an element here. So expertise, I mean, I think there needs to be a recognition and then there needs to be an investment, maybe in new people. You could bring in lots of young people as experts um, in the places that you're working. You could develop youth advisory groups. You could set up workshops where youth could teach you about what it's like to be a young person um, and what kind of education they're looking for. You need to, um, you need probably workshops to help you think about what are the key youth subgroups we should start with? How, you know, of course there are campaigns to stop girls from becoming child wives, but once they become child wives, can't they get an education? How do you reach them? How do you talk to their husbands? How do you get them in school? Where can they go to school? When can they go to school? Where's the daycare? On and on. A lot of these things are practical, but I think it, 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 it creates a shift in our thinking to start looking at all these young people who aren't in our programs. What do they see? What do they want? And how can we start outreaching to them? And then being creative in a cost-effective way for donors um, how do you reach all these people? Um, how can we use technology uh, to reach them? How can mentorships uh, start uh, with, with teachers uh, such as distance education? There are all kinds of things we can do, but we just don't have the expertise. And frankly, I think in many situations, not much curiosity uh, about this issue. So um, there's a lot that can be done um, and those are just some, some. Thank you so much, Mark. That's very helpful. I think we'll take one last question. And just to note to the participants that we will have all these questions shared together with the recording. So you will receive the questions. And I think some of them will share them with Mark and the team. So they will provide written answers. But we'll just take one last one before we conclude this uh, webinar. So the question is, given the lack of definition of and funding for youth, do you have some key outcomes that you would like to see in a high level conference to galvanize EIE commitment for youth? For example, maybe a percentage of commitment to some commitment to youth programs, or maybe ECW increases the ceiling age of programming from 18 to 24? Over to you, Mark and May. Um, 
May, why don't I invite you to go first and then I'll, 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 I'll I guess I'll follow up. Go sure. Uh, Mark, I know you would specifically appreciate this question, um, and it's something we feel uh, very sort of passionate about. We really do feel like the next step in this report is really just the beginning. I think when we embarked on this research process, we didn't we didn't um, envision that the report to end up being just the beginning of what we see is a need for a much um, longer conversation that involves stakeholders, in, involves actors in the field, donors in the field, to collectively discuss what needs to be done and what actions need to be taken in order for us as an education and emergency sector um, to, uh, to meaningfully respond to out-of-school youth needs on certified education. And one of our suggestions actually has been this this meeting, this donor meeting, this um, stakeholders meeting, to come together in a round table to confidentially sort of discuss these issues in a in a in a space where 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 in a safe space, <laughs> as one might say. Um, I know Mark also feels very strongly about this need for a convening. So, Mark, back to you. Thank you, May. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, the idea for an, an event really was a widely shared um, uh, recommendation when we circulated them with the core team and the youth advisory group that this was needed. And the reason is, is to sort of get, allow people in a confidential setting um, to, to think about, gee, what do we do? This is a big population. We're not reaching them. So how do we do this? How do we start to do this? Because a lot of the challenges are really basic. Like, what do we mean by youth? There's no shared definition. There can be different definitions of youth um, within the same organization. Donor organizations, implementing organizations, there's no shared idea of who you're talking about. How are you supposed to reach them if you don't know who they are? Um, so some of these issues are pretty basic. And to, you know, maybe we need working groups to start to come out of this meeting to start thinking about these issues. Um, and I think also to, um, in this confidential setting that May mentioned, to get people to not be defensive um, and to think uh, in an in a honest way about, yeah, this is a big issue. We haven't been dealing with it. How do we do this in a way that's productive? That really moves forward and does something new for our program, for our, for our, um, you know, for what we do. This is this would be a new horizon for us, I guess. And and because of that, it seemed that gathering as a group with donors, practitioners, um, youth themselves, um, all in one place to start the thinking, frankly, um, and you know, including informally about, wow, this is big. We don't have a lot of money and on and on. Um, uh, how do we start doing this? How do we start demonstrating inclusion to all these young people who don't have access to education right now, which is something we all recognize as important that needs to be addressed. So that's the purpose of uh, convening uh, a major event. Maybe we need more than one uh, just to get the ball rolling in a, in a positive way. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much, May. And I think uh, we will conclude it here because I think we run out of time. I wish we had two or three hours to continue having this conversation. And I would like to take this opportunity to uh, appreciate our wonderful speakers for investing their time uh, and their resources into this study and for being here to share with us the, the findings yeah, so I think all of us should go away with the thinking of how do we ensure that in our spaces of work, we ensure that these findings get into policy. I think that's the question that we um, we need to really think about. Uh, that's how we are, they are going to be effective and uh, affect lives or those youth in the EIE space. So thank you so much uh, to the presenters and also to the participants for taking the time to join. We appreciate your participation. We appreciate your questions. And uh, as mentioned in the chat, uh, we are going to follow up with the questions that have not been answered here. 
Mark and the team will provide answers to those questions. And when we share the recording, we will also share those questions together with the answers. So do not worry, you will get a response to your question. And then I would just also wish to appreciate everyone who has put a hand in preparing this webinar. We have uh, uh, those in the background like who came together to sort of like prepare and make everything happen. Sarah and the team from INI, uh, I wanna appreciate you for doing that. And for everyone who has had a hand in just making this event a success, I wanna say a big thank you uh, to all of you. And uh, with that, we will come to the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, David.